We are talking once again with Ari Cohn. He is the founder and president of the Post-Prison Education Program, and this is the monthly edition of the Post-Prison Education Program radio show. Good afternoon, Ari. Uh, afternoon it is. Right. Hey, Mike, how are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm all right. I uh, unexpectedly uh, got my booster shot, my Pfizer booster yesterday, and I was elated. I was so like Sophie and Ann and everybody in the office yesterday had to put up with this, my older than dirt self jumping around, hollering out, I'm Superman, bring on the kryptonite, right? <laughs> you know, and <laughs> laughing and, but I, um, I had another go round. I'm having another go around with cancer and more biopsies because of some return and of one place. And, and so when I was with my doctor that's worked on those things for years, she was said, you know, you can go down to level A and get your booster. And I'm like, I've been anticipating eagerly wanting I, we have all these we have co-workers and people that we're really close to and care about that just are in the they just seem to have covid just swirling around i mean covid is no joke and anybody that thinks it is is insane as far as i'm concerned and 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 I, honestly come around me without a mask and see what happens first thing that happens is i pull a knife and then I and I start talking a little like I might be slightly antisocial, and you ought to move on. And uh, but I'm we we have so many people. Uh, we have a coworker who's uh, uh, roommate. Mm-hmm. No, uh, no, but his roommate uh, got has COVID, mm. and, and, and so then then Kevin went and got tested and. Um, and is negative, and is as you've met Maddie Gates before, and she, you know, so she's at UW, graduating senior in psychology, headed for law school, and brilliant, and so on. And uh, she decided to move into her sorority house, and and they had a breakthrough case within the last week. And then, so she had to go get tested and t- tested negative. And then they had another breakthrough case. So she had to go get tested. And then she was very sick. And, and I've been very sick, frankly. And so it's, it's scary. It's scary. Yeah. And so um, we've just had it swirling all around us, really. And so I was ecstatic. I even posted on Facebook, I think it was like that I was ecstatic to get the booster. And, uh, and, and by the way, for the third time, no, no negative anything. Not, not, my first shot, which was at Kaiser in Tacoma, I went all the way to Tacoma to get Pfizer. This is the beginning of the year. No, no repercussions or feeling sick at all. In fact, I, I left to Kaiser and, in Tacoma that day and drove down to Olympia to Wagner's Bakery, which is a favorite place of mine. Got cherry pie, key lime pie, and a whole bunch of other stuff, eclairs probably, and went right back to the office. This is when we were still in Soto and worked a full day. My second day, because I had read so much sort of scary stuff in the, in the media, I thought I was going to be sick, so I planned on being out for a day or two. And I, um, so I went straight home and I went to bed and there was no need to do that. At five o'clock, I woke up and I'm hungry and it's like, hey, let's time to go to dinner. Like, and I felt great. So I actually walked up to Kasaku, which is a favorite restaurant of mine. I love Kasaku and, and, um, and ate, ate and just no problems at all. And yesterday, my shoulder's a little bit sore right here. But yesterday, the booster um, at Kaiser on Capitol Hill, and I and I'm relieved. I'm 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 really relieved. So, um, because I'm I'm scared of this. I mean, it, I I listened to a doctor being interviewed on NPR a couple of weeks ago, and he was like, and he's seen people die, 
And he said, this is, this is a, it's a horrible way to die. And it's not the way I want to die, you know, like, so, uh, gasping for breath and suffocating and, <laughs> and all of that. And, um, I mean, I actually sort of saw somebody die suffocating. It was cave diving when I was a student in Florida at the University of Florida during my first marriage. And and uh, a neighbor had an employee who wanted to go scuba diving. And my neighbor and I were both certified scuba divers. And and had done a lot of dangerous dives, cave diving in North Florida. And the young man who worked for Donnie wanted to die, wanted to go with us. And we shouldn't have let him go. And I feel it's many, many years, 50, 60 years later. And I feel horrible about it to this day and always will. But he, he wasn't certified. He didn't know how to body breathe. And he wasn't trained. And he had very poor equipment. He was poor. <laughs> and so he had very poor equipment. And so when he got down to about 80 foot, 80 feet, he didn't have a good, he didn't have good equipment. So it was, he thought he was out of air when he wasn't. Um, and, uh, and, and, and anyway, he eventually died in that cave. It's just, it's not, that's just not a way I want to go. Uh, uh, just gasping for air with a bat ventilator jammed down my throat. So anyway, I'm, I'm, very pleased to have gotten a booster. Uh, and I'm really pleased that Kaiser has it. You yeah. know, here in town, I didn't have to go to Tacoma to get it. I was able to write up on Capitol Hill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was like, anyway, that's. Uh, it's nice when, nice when our health care system works. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and I'm not sure if this is government's healthcare system working or if it's Kaiser working. <laughs> yeah. But Ki- Kaiser for me, you know, has been very good uh, in most cases, not all cases. And so um, we should, um, I, I want to, as you know, Mike, we, um, we did a whole radio show quite a few months ago where we had Emma and I think Hannah on and and we were up in arms uh, over the fact that that it was very clear that the Department of Corrections, despite their front facing lies and 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 that's what it is. It's just blatant dishonesty to, you know, trying portraying themselves to the public, the legislature, the governor is this wonderful agency helping people build lives worth living. They're, they're exactly the opposite of that. And every time they claim to be a good agency doing good things, they are just, I want to cuss so bad right now. And I know I, I, I always have to worry about the, 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 the those helicopters flying in from Washington, D.C., then gunships and paratroopers jumping out and hauling you away and somebody canceling your license. And I have to, I have to, I have three languages. One is profanity, one is English, and one is Hebrew. And I, I can't talk Hebrew on the show because nobody knows what I was saying. And I can't talk profanity because the SEC will take your license away. But I want this. I want to. I want to. I don't know. You know. I I don't like this on. I mean, I to say that I to say that I don't like dishonesty is just I go crazy when I'm confronted with it. And you know, on a personal level, lie to me and see if I don't come out of my pocket with a knife, or worse, or. Uh, um, I'm not having it. And so, so it just drives me crazy when DOC pretends uh, or tries to tell the public, voting public, uh, and the governor and the legislature and the media that they're this wonderful agency doing good things. And we learned over the last six plus months that what they're doing is they're locking all, all prisoners are being locked out of programming. So, so, so the Department of Correction that's charged with having safer communities and help people re- rehabilitate is doing the exact, the exact opposite, simultaneous to lying and lying and lying and lying. And so um, we had this uh, 
Uh, I mean, we've got so many people we're working with uh, that are prisoners who want to program and would, would excel and desperately need to program. You know, that hundreds of thousands of people that are in custody right now are going back for resentencing and they're trying to build rec- because of court of, uh, Supreme Court cases, Court of Appeals cases. They're going back uh, for resentencing. And so it's important that they have a good record to present to a judge or to ISRB. Hey, I got my Associate of Arts degree, or I, I've taken these college classes, or I've done this, or I've done these positive things, you know. And the Department of Corrections just blatantly, uh, they're preventing that from happening. And so, um, I mean, they're concerted effort. They're blocking it from happening. And uh, and so when we when when we found out about it and uh, 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 then Emma and Hannah wrote a piece and, uh, um, and, and we put it out to our listserv and Marcus, the editor of South Seattle, Emerald, who's a really hero in this community, an amazing man, published it for us. And, and, uh, and, uh, so we've been, we've been, so it, in prison right now is a really horrible, I mean, pr- prison's never a good place, but it's never been as bad as it is right now. And so it's simultaneous to Mike Oberlin and, 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 and DOC, uh, Department of Corrections. Uh, Mike is the assistant secretary. I'm looking for this email that I want to send to you. Mike is the assistant secretary in charge of the prisons division and uh and uh uh, uh Cheryl Strange is the new secretary and so simultaneous to Obenland putting out a press release saying that they're discontinuing the use of solitary confinement for disciplinary infractions. They continue that that's a lie. Mike Obenland's press release, if any of you have seen it. It's a it's a it's a straight up effing lie. It's a lie. They have not discontinued it. You know, as soon as I saw it, I wrote Mike an email and I said, so this guy who's in the hole in Walla Walla, based on your based on your press release, you're going to be releasing him to the compound and general population and, and maybe even return him from Walla Walla back to the prison that you transferred him out of in Monroe, where he'll be closer to his family and so on. Uh, you know, or are you going to keep, continue to keep him in the hole? And Obenland, of course, didn't answer. Uh, but I can tell you that Noel Caldellas continues to be in the hole, despite that lying, deceitful press release. And uh, um, uh, so anyway, things are horrible inside the prisons. The COVID staff shortages. um and so on, and and it should be easy for anybody to understand that conditions are so bad that that there have been attempted suicides and successful. It's pretty horrible to, to describe a suicide as successful, right? It's success. It's successful. You you kill yourself, and so that's a successful suicide. But anyway. Um, a person at Monroe, I'll just read you this email I got. This email came from Ina McNeese, who is a captain at the Department of Corrections um, at Monroe. And and I'm just going to read it. There were two incidents. One was an attempt on the 24th. And the other was suicide on the 29th. Two separate individuals. Um on the 24th, a bed sheet was used and tied to a power cord. On the second, the second on the 29th, uh, the individual used coax cable. Uh, and then, uh, uh, in another email, uh, Ina McNeese writes, this was related to me by uh, CUS, which is a housing unit manager, and I believe it may have been a violator. So McNeese was saying, 
that uh, uh, um, that the person, you know, what happens? So you're in the hole for a violation, S- simultaneous to Oberlin saying they're not using intensive management units anymore for disciplinary infractions and so on, punishments. There's somebody in the hall uh, due to a violation, maybe in the community. Maybe you showed up late for an appointment with your CCO, or maybe you relapsed and had a dirty UA, uh, whatever. But this is a violator, in, you know, and, and things are so bad, that person is dead now from suicide, simultaneous. To, so so I, I don't know. You know, I think everybody that knows me uh, knows that, uh, you know, we've been, I I seem to have been close to death, too close to death all my life, right? It's starting with my father's death and suicide on Father's Day in 1975. And, uh, and, And many deaths, that we've uh, of uh, with people who we've met and come to love and, and and cherish as they came into our life through the post prison education program and, and uh, Joey Jensen is always at the top of my mind on that and um, you know I'm going to show you this this is on my desk so I'm in my office right now and Joey did this. He created it in a, in a graphic design class in, in the East Complex of the Washington State Penitentiary. And Don Wilchius and I were in the classroom. And but when he and we saw this, we literally saw that that beautiful artwork just rise up on an Apple computer screen, just just rise up. It was extraordinary. It would take your breath away. But. Joey died from suicide, and and then some years later, Truth Griffith, who became executive director of our nonprofit, died from suicide. So suicide is a really tough issue for me and everybody that I work with. And and so I'm not going to just read something from a, a DOC employee saying, you know, reporting two deaths in a very short period of time or attempted suicide and, and a successful suicide and just kind of continue with my day and go get my beans and rice for lunch and not give it another thought. It's, 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 uh, overwhelming. And the other thing is I'm not going to, uh, we're not going to, uh, sit down and be quiet about, uh, the, the department of corrections lying at the very highest level to the media to the electorate, to the governor's office, to the legislature uh, uh, about being this wonderful agency that helps people build lives worth living when, in fact, they're the exact opposite. So the fact that they're continuing to block uh, prisoners from programming, uh, we're pursuing that. In fact, we've got we have we have a retainer agreement with Perkins Coy, which I'm very proud that Perkins Coy is even willing to represent us. They're a very large, uh, prominent, highly respected law firm. And uh, and we work with one of the partners there, Tony McCormick. And I asked Tony when all when all this denial of uh, of programming was obvious and admitted by DOC at the, from DOC headquarters people. Um, I asked Tony to get somebody, one of the associates that works for Perkins Coy, to do a public records act request to the Department of Correction to find out how many people have been historically locked out of programming and how many are currently being locked out. So we... Uh, that that Public Records Act was request was filed by Perkins Coy almost two weeks ago, and then we worked uh, uh, with a, with a, uh, somebody who's like she she works with Microsoft is to analyzing uh, and I guess awarding contracts right for Microsoft has her title is 
mile long. It's very impressive just to know somebody with that title. And we had we had her work with uh, Ian at Perkins Coy, making sure we had we that the ask in the Public Records Act. This is request is 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 as um, thorough as it could possibly be. And so we the modified Public Records Act requests. Uh, but which is more expansive than the original one that got to DOC last Wednesday, and uh, and they're already, you know, they're all do, already doing what they normally do. You know, it's like the Federal Bureau of Prisons I refer to as being the lie, the Bureau of Lie and Deny, and DOC is sort of taking on that mantle. So, so if you ask them for true, accurate information. They'll say, oh, yeah, we'll get that to you in 44 days. <laughs> right. So, so Perkins Coy has an email from DOC's Public Records Act saying they're going to take at least 44 days to get the truth to us. You know, so um, if it was information that, that cast them in a, per, in, a per, in a positive light, Cheryl Strange would probably hop in a Ferrari or a helicopter or the governor's plane and fly up here to hand deliver it to me. Here, here, here. If it's, you know, if it's positive information, but if it's negative, then they're going to duck, hide and run. And uh, so, but I think something that everybody wants to do uh, if they want to do it, there's two things I really hope everybody that's listening will do is, is Google, um, you want, I want you to find this article, please, on the South Seattle Emerald. Uh, and it's entitled, uh, Washington's DOC is Trapping Incarcerated Men in Solitary Confinement. And it was written by Hannah Hoga, Emma Hogan uh, and Hannah Bulletin, uh, who I was lucky enough to be able to work with, privileged enough to work with. And... Uh, and so you can uh, you can go you can just Google Emma Hogan um, uh, South Seattle Emerald and you'll get the article that I w- I really hope everybody will take time to read. Yeah, it's a the, July twenty eighth article. Yeah, and then and and, and and you're talking about that article by the way, and then I want to direct people to the DOC's website where they can see actual DOC data. Uh, and get an idea what numbers are impacted. But um, uh, the uh, I forget what day. Let me search my Outlook real quick. But uh, I was um, really, it's not every day that we get a call from CNN New York. Uh, although was it the first it has, it's happened more than a few times, but in, uh, um, uh, uh, we got a call, we got an email from a reporter with CNN New York, uh, on the first. So that was last Friday, early in the morning and the South, the South Seattle Emerald article that, uh, that uh, just t- told everyone how to find that had made its way through the cyberspace back to the East coast and got and picked up by CNN, New York city. And, and they wanted to interview uh, Hannah or Emma because they wrote the, that piece. And, and then, and they, their email was like, are anybody a post prison education program? But, but, but I've got to rush this article out. I'm under deadline. Can we talk today? So, Friday a week ago, uh, Emma and I ended up in a recorded video interview with a guy from New York, CNN New York, talking about this issue. Um, and and you know that one of the things that had gotten its way back east was Obenland, Mike Obenland announcing. And, you know, his press release, as far as I'm concerned, is a ruse. You can't, that's putting it kindly because people are still in the hall in Washington state prisons for infractions. So if it was a truthful, honest press release, instead of a bald faced PR move uh, and lie, 
then, for example, Noel called Dallas wouldn't be in the hole in the Washington State Penitentiary. And, you know, we're talking, you know, we're talking, emailing and talking to his mom almost daily. And, again, and plus checking where he's at with DOC's website. He's in the hole, despite Mike Obenland's fake, disingenuous, ruse, deceitful of a press release. There are people all over the state of Washington who are um, in uh, still in intensive intensive management units for infractions for this. So, so the whole still be in use by the Washington State Department of Correction. Anyway, so we we were glad to be contacted by CNN on this uh, issue. It's so important to us. And as late as this morning, uh, the reporter e- was emailing with Emma and I about um, th- there, th- it's going to be, a, it's not going to just be one piece. It's going to be very in-depth and it's extensive. And they're, t- they're looking at this issue nationwide. And so I'm excited about that. And um, so while I, I want to get everybody, go to doc.wa.gov. And then when you, they'll get you to the Department of Corrections website. And up to on the top, you'll see News and Info. And then if you get the drop-down menu, you'll see Research and Data Analytics. And once you click on that, click on Data Sets and Statistics Directory. And then please, please take time to do this and, and click on agency fact card, right? And then you'll see there, uh, down the lower left hand corner, total confinement sentence length ordered. Uh, and, and so they break down on their website, prisoners, the percentage of prisoners doing less than two years, doing two to five years, five to 10, over 10 life with the possibility of parole or release or life without the possibility of release. Uh, and, and if you add up the percentages of people who are, have, are doing more than, or more than four years from release, it's 70%. So when you, when, when you look at the, the fact, the absolute acknowledged fact that the Department of Correction has been for a very long time and continues locking prisoners who are more than four years from the door out of programming. You're talking about 70% of the people in the custody of, of Governor Jay Inslee's Washington State Department of Corrections. That's, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what crime I can talk about on a radio show that, that is as egregious, as heinous, uh, that would be a good analogy, you know. Uh, 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 it's a crime that the Department of Corrections is so D-O-D, D-A-M-N, dishonest, blatantly, irrefutably dishonest um, to the public, the governor's office, the uh, legislature, uh, as they are representing themselves to be this good agency helping people build lives, um, build or rebuild lives, when they're, in fact they're doing the exact opposite. So they, they absolutely, and this gets worse, Mike, um, so they, they um, which is almost impossible. So, so I mean, condition, when I say that, conditions in the prison are so bad, people are attempting suicide and successfully taking their own lives. Uh, I mean, just imagine interrupting myself. Sitting, you're sitting in a concrete cell by yourself, and life is in the Department of Corrections. Cheryl Strange, Cheryl E. Strange's um, Washington State Department of Corrections, and Governor Jay Inslee's Washington State Department of Corrections. They have made life so bad in these prisons that sitting in in these concrete boxes. Things are so miserable, you decide that, that you should take your life. That's just, and, and then, uh, but then they, uh, that's just, uh, anyway, on the other hand, you know, there aren't too many people in the Washington State Legislature, as you know, who I think well of. And one of the surprise people this last session 
whose name I didn't even know is Mari Levitt, M-A-R-I Levitt, L-E-A-V-I-T-T. She's in the House of Representatives. And she she ran a bill last session, 1044, that, that requires, makes it law that the Department of Corrections has to allow people with long sentences to program. You know, and Mari's on several committees. She's vice chair of the education committee. And, and what's going on right now, this is how brazen, the, I really want to cuss. I mean, I'm going to, someday I'm going to blast you out with a bunch of Hebrew that nobody will know I'm cussing, but boy, I'll be like major cussing, you know, and I can get away with it. And the idiots at the SEC in New York won't know any, they're too stupid to know anybody. So anyhow, uh, and I'll be smiling, but, uh, uh, but, uh, um, uh, so yeah, we, we might have an upcoming Hebrew lesson on one of the, on the post prison <laughs> education lawyers, just, just so I can talk my second favorite language. Po- we could make family. that a regular segment. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, uh, what, what the, what the DOC is doing? I mean, how, how brazen can you get? You just flip a bird at the Washington state legislature. That's what they're doing. Mari Levitt's 1044 is in, it's, it's it passed the legislature. The governor signed it into law. It is in force. And they're, they're just proud. I mean, we're in the, we have these lengthy teams meetings with DOC headquarters people over this issue, including Mark Kukska, who is a senior administrator, Danielle Arbruster, who's an assistant secretary, and, 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 and Loretta Taylor, who's in charge of programs for DOC. Um, and, and they, it, they come off as proud of what they're doing. This would be like, to me, this is like being the cop in Cleveland that shoots to death the little 12 year old child and, and sort of seems to be proud of it. And the law enforcement agency that the cop worked for, you know, they never, the, the kids never, the, 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 you know, no, nothing good ever comes of that. But it's like, yeah, yeah, we shot the kid. Yeah, we. You know, we, yeah, we did these horrible acts and we acknowledge doing them and we're standing by doing them and we're going to continue to do it. And that's why I have Perkins Coy um, getting getting this information uh, through the Public Records Act because because uh, DOC, uh, DOC should be happy if all I do is take that to CNN to New York. If I don't get it in the New York Times and every damn other thing I can think of, if I don't hire a staff member to do nothing but get that negative information out to the public and basically have somebody put it up Jay Inslee's where the sun doesn't shine for allowing the, the, this to happen, for allowing what's going on to happen. I mean, in the last analysis, this is Jay Inslee's DOC, but but they're flipping a bird at the legislature. I mean, Barry Levitt run, ran this bill. It passed the House. It passed the Senate. It was signed into law by Inslee, and, and it's House Bill 1044, and the DOC is just flipping a bird at everybody, like, uh, so what if it's law? Uh, yeah, so, so what if we're the supposed top law enforcement agency in the state, uh, we're also, it, it seems to me DOC is the top lawbreaker. I mean, there's no doubt if anybody ever wants to talk about the MAT program, there's no doubt that Jay Inslee is the biggest drug dealer in the state of Washington. He is the driving force behind more than $10 million worth of drugs, Suboxone being flooded into the prisons for more than the last year. And, and we've got information from a whistleblower at DOC headquarters on the MAP program and how it's been employed. But so you got, you got, you got the DOC just flipping a bird at the Washington state legislature. It's like, so what if 1044 is law? We're not going to, we have not been making programming, um, programs available to people who are more than four years from release. And we are not going to, um, and it's just that simple. Uh, it's, it's I don't know. I I don't have words for any of this. Actually, I don't have words. Um, do you have yeah. the Do you have the res- As an organization, I know your resources are extremely limited. But um, is that something you would pursue as a lawsuit potentially against the DOC? Um, I mean, do you have standing to do that? 
I don't know. I would have to ask. I would have to ask uh, uh, Tony McCormick at Perkins Coy whether we do or not. But but I think I think I think my my first reaction to your question is 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 whether that's a class action or not. And you know there is a and th- there's a, a small law firm in town. Uh, uh, that has a, a that has some really wonderful people at it, and they specialize in um, they specialize in class action lawsuits. And I can always remember Toby's name right, but I can't ever remember the name of his firm. But I'm just going to throw it out there. But I, I think thanks for the idea because I am going to talk to Toby Marshall, a Terrell Marshall Law Group. And and ask Toby if this might if the, if there might be a class action lawsuit here. That's what he loves to do. And I'll talk to Tony about it at Perkins Coy also. But it's just, I mean, the wrong party. It seems to me, other than the prisoners who aren't allowed to program, is the legislature. Right now, the legislature should be up in arms that the DOC ha- is brazen enough, has the balls to just basically say. We're not follow. We're not obeying the law, and we're we acknowledge that, and we're proud that we're not obeying the law. And by the way, here we are in this recorded teams meeting, telling you we're not going to obey the law. So, um, you know, another aspect of this is Eldon Vale and I were talking about this the other day, um, but. Um, When I met Eldon, who I've said a million times on the show, I just I, I trust, believe, really respect, admire Eldon Vale, always will. He's a he, it w- this would be a better state if he was governor, and this would be a better Department of Corrections if he or Dan Pachoki were the secretary, not Cheryl Strange. I, I frankly believe Cheryl Strange doesn't even have the ability to pull off what needs to be done to make that to change the DOC from being rotten and corrupt to being what it needs to be and should be and live up to its mission. I think only only two people in the state could do that, Eldon and, and Dan Pachoki. But I, I was talking to Eldon, and we were talking about the day I met him, which was uh, 2006, I think, at DOC headquarters in Tumwater. And that day, Harold Clark... I want to tell you know I tried to get I on no notice to Sophie our operations manager I tried to get her into this this morning but I didn't uh, didn't give her adequate notice so she's not here but yesterday we were sitting in our conference room having lunch and 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 we were talking about an innocent person having been executed recently and and uh, and 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 then a murder by law enforcement where law enforcement wasn't held accountable. And then, and, and she, and she was like no recourse. And I want to talk about that no recourse issue that Sophie brought up yesterday. And, uh, but, uh, when in that initial meeting with, with Ellen and I, there was Harold Clark who finally Gregoire fired. It took her a year to get her head out of her ass. Uh, she should have never hired Harold Clark. It was one of the worst hires in the history of the United States. He, he, he was, a, he was Harold Clark and Bernie Warner are tied for being the worst secretaries in the history of the Department of Corrections ever. Um, and both, you know, it, but anyway, Mike Paris, who was in charge of programs at the time for DOC, was also in that meeting. And Mike Paris was showing me and a bunch of our original board members and, and, and other people I had with me the education budget for 2006. And he was proud. This, just, this is stupefying to me. Mike Paris was proud that their budget for education that year was $16 million. And so DOC in these meetings, these teams meetings we've been having with them, has admitted that their budget for this year is 19 million. So adju- adjusted for inflation, let me let me emphasize that adjusted for inflation, um, 
uh, <laughs> this year's budget is, what is this, 2021, is less by far than what it was in 2006. So a real, uh, you know, one of the problems, um, of the many problems, you know, so when Cheryl Strange and her staff decides how much, how much are we going to ask the Washington State Legislature to appropriate, appropriate to the Department of Corrections for, for programming. And then it, they made that decision. And th- so then, then that now they want to whine and cry. We don't have enough money to deliver programs to the prisoners, right? And, and, and I'm like, I'm telling, I'm like telling Mark Kuchka and, and Loretta Taylor, who works for Mark and, and, and Danielle Arbruster, who I think reports, I mean, I, I mean, Mark, Mark reports to Danielle. I, I'm like, you know, you asked for too little, you know, and you, they had to know the moral consequence of asking for too little money. It's just so goddamn odd. Op- I, I, that's a, okay with that. That's okay. That's just so, so obvious um, that uh, that if you ask for too little too little money to accomplish a task, then you're not going to be able to accomplish a task, and then, <laughs> that's a moral issue. Damn it, that is a moral issue. I'm. Um, I think I've mentioned it before. It, 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 it's, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, I went through counseling in the early eighties, trying to get my brain past my father's death and suicide. Uh, and, and I had this wonderful opportunity. It was incredible. There was, uh, I was at the university of North Carolina and there was, um, uh, a private hospital. It's actually was, it's kind of, it was super cool, uh, where F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife Zelda died in a fire at a psychiatric hospital called Highland Hospital. And it was like a cigarettes in bed kind of a thing. Uh, but w- that, that had, that, that place was still there in 1983 and they had an outpatient, uh, psychology lab. And I was able to, bulldoze and beg or whatever my way this that place that was sixty thousand dollars a month to be having counseling there that place was no joke but for me it was well worth it i really wanted it bad and i needed to i excuse me i needed to not have my dad continue haunting me all night long every night and so but anyway i went through three days of testing in this outpatient psychology lab and every Day for three days, I walked over from the University of North Carolina and went up to Highland Hospital, and went in this lab and went through testing, 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 testing all day long. And I, and so I, as a result, I know more about myself than I'll bet you anybody you will ever meet knows about themselves. I mean, I, I, I know what my, I know what my psychological uh, breakdown is. I know what, I know who I am, what I'm, what I'm about. I, I know my diagnosis and. Um, but one of the things that came out of that was all that testing was at the end, I got a meeting with his name was Bill Barley. He was a psychologist. And then there was a psychiatrist that he worked from before named George Doss. And, and George Doss was loved roses and had beautiful roses. And um, but anyway, at the end of those three days, I had a sit down and. Barley and I and, and got to sit down in George Doss's beautiful fancy pants office, and I got a full report on like this is this is who you are, right? And one of the things they told me that has never made sense to me, but so I stuck out in my mind, is um, that I have an overstated sense of right and wrong. You know, the thing is that that you could have an that anybody that there could be such a thing as an overstated sense of right and wrong makes no sense to me that's where i'm at you know if something is right i had a t-shirt on yesterday i wish i had it today but it's like rebel against injustice if something is wrong effing fight it you know go to war against it right um don't walk away you know and, and pretend it's not there 
And so, so this whole thing with DOC asking for so little money from the legislature that they know up front what the, as when they send their ask over to the legislature that if that's appropriated, they can't accomplish the mission that they're supposed to accomplish, uh, that they tell the public that they will accomplish, that they're there to do. It just all this just flares up in my it makes me crazy. Uh, and, and thank God that I'm working with people like Emma and Hannah and who, who uh, and Rosalind and Sophie and so on, uh, who are as indignant times 10,000 about these issues as I am, and, and including several of our board members. So um, the budget thing is a big concern. It's 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 like you know if it's uh, um, I don't know uh, they they've made it so they can't they've made DOC made it so it's impossible for them to do their job mm-hmm. right they, and so so they claim uh, their 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 hands are tied but they're the yeah. ones that tied their hands yeah no really so they're just um, I mean, and, and Lori Jenkins and all the clowns at the legislature, I mean, they should be asking themselves, why are we here? Why are we there? Why do we go through session? Why do we have hearings? Why do we pass bills? You know, why do we submit bills? What, why bother if the law we create is going to be ignored? And, you know, the fact of the matter is the secretary of the Department of Corrections is on the governor's cabinet. So there's no damn reason. I mean, the legislature should actually, if they had any courage, which not one of them does, um, th- then then there would be a letter from from the House and the Senate to Inslee demanding that he call his secretary of DOC on the carpet and just like and just like spank her ass, you know, or just I mean, just like you would an errant child, just shake your finger like Cheryl. You know, this is the law, and you, your agency, you're going to obey the law, and you're going to make programming available to these prisoners who are in your custody and care, and you are not going to continue to disobey the law. I mean, it just needs to be, um, you know, where I was raised, my mother was a tyrant, and uh, but where I was raised... If my mother would talk about laying down the law, right? And boy, it was. If my mother said something was something, then it was. And once she had laid down the law, regardless of what it was, whether it was make straight A's or mow the lawn, you darn well better get your skinny bony ass up there and get it done, or, or you know, or 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 she would have my dad beating your bare butt with a board or whatever. Or, uh, but so, but you know, Inslee needs to have that kind of conversation with Cheryl Strange. Like, you, you know, you're an embarrassment. Your agency is the biggest lawbreaker, but it fits. It fits perfectly. He's the biggest drug dealer in the state. He absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely, beyond, absolutely, I can prove it. And I, and again, we, I mean, we got a whistleblower from DOC headquarters that's, that's really laid it out to us two years ago. Um, uh, Pre-COVID, it seems like three years ago, but it, Jay Inslee is the biggest drug dealer in the state of Washington. They've dumped millions and millions of dollars of Suboxone into the prisons, which makes it almost impossible for prisoners to be clean and sober or come out and successfully re- re-enter society. And and so 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 simultaneous to Inslee being this incredibly significant drug dealer, uh, uh, you got his secretary of DOC. Uh, being a lawbreaker, just flipping off the legislature, and then you got the let you got the legislature just doing what they do best, just like laying down and doing nothing. You know? uh, and, and it seems like each of those problems, the the issues we've been talking about during the last hour, compound upon each other. So you've got Jay yeah. Inslee uh, bringing this Suboxone in that. Um, basically encourages or uh, is a catalyst for people's behavior um, becoming uh, radical in that they end up then being put in solitary confinement. 
and then in parallel to that, you've the agency is removing access to programming. Yeah, yeah. And each of those compound upon the other that then drives people back to wanting more Suboxone. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that reminds me. Um, that reminded me of something. But it just skipped right through my mind and went over there somewhere. But uh, happens to all. But, of but no, you're exactly um, I mean, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's uh, I I know what I was going to tell you. So, you know, Maddie Gates has been on the show before, and and she's a co-worker still. She's she, for quite a while. She was our director of applicant student services, and and I watched her for it seems like the last nine months. Just put her heart and soul into working with this woman who just released from the Washington Correction Center for Women uh, two Mondays ago. And and I'm just going to put her name out there, (laughs) Kai Martinez. And, I mean, Maddie had a standing appointment with Kai every week, and they mapped out her future, you know, her housing, where she is now, that when she came out, we would get clothing and groceries for her. We would get a computer in her hand. We would get a cell phone in her hands that she would release to Tacoma, that she would go to Tacoma Community College and pursue the paralegal program. But the point is I watched Maddie – just like a mom loving a child, really, pour her heart and soul um, into to Kai having a positive and successful release. And two two weeks before Kai was due to release, um, a prisoner called me, uh, who and actually was the prisoner who had introduced me to Kai quite a while ago. Uh, and told me that DOC had pushed her to sign up for the MAP program. I, it was so heartbreaking. It was everything I could. I, I actually, I started, I was in the, I'm in the middle of, I've been firing off so many emails, Cheryl Strange, that I just, I, but I was, I was, I, I really, I was heartbroken because I don't see how you can come out of prison after seven years in, in prison um, on Suboxone. And and be successful, you know, not relapse, not be high, not, you know, not not get kicked out of your transition house, be able to go to school, do well. And so 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 DOC putting somebody on Suboxone before they release is is just tantamount to the the Department of Corrections making it as close to impossible, if not impossible, for somebody that was successful reentry. Uh, as you can get, and I was just heartbroken that like two weeks of, uh, t- before Kai's release, uh, DOC either put her, signed her up for the MAP program or encouraged her to to sign up for it. And I spent the last two weeks leading up to last Monday uh, just scared to death that she would she would not have a successful uh, reentry because of DOC encouraging her into the math program. And it's, it's, it's just heartbreaking to see people who really want to do well, who, who, who want to be valuable members of our communities, um, just get scuttled by the agency that's supposed to be there for them. I don't know. Uh, and so, like when Sophie and I, living up to our commitment to Kai, uh, Monday a week ago, uh, we got a uh, you know get an Enterprise rental car, 116 bucks for the day, and drive to Federal Way to to meet Kai on her release from prison, and 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 then. Go to Ross's, and we bought three hundred and fifty dollar gift cards, total of three hundred and fifty, so she could buy um, 
close and then Winco and another 300 or $350 gift card so she could buy groceries. And the day, and before we left, we took one of our Google pixel phones, which we keep in inventory here for four releases. Uh, and we had, we had Verizon wireless put a new number on it. So the first thing, you know, you know, is meeting her up as we've been promising for months and months to do and putting a phone in her hand and uh, gift cards so she can buy clothing and gift cards so she can have groceries and, and so on. And, uh, um, and, and just all the time while we're doing that worried to death that, that, Hensley's and Cheryl Strange's math program might destroy somehow along the way her ability to have a good life from this point forward. And you know, you'll remember, uh, you remember this little podunk radio station that's two blocks from our office, KEXP, where, where I wish you still. I, w- I wish, you know, I wish you were with, with your KODX, which is such a wonderful thing, Mike, and thank you. I wish you would just recreate Mind Over Matters. I, I, I loved that show that you had for, how long did you have Mind Over Matters at KEXP? 20, 30 years? 25 years. I've got Mind Over Matters mugs, coffee mugs, and I have Mind Over Matters t-shirts. And I used to love to wear those t-shirts because... That's really, a, that's a great saying. I don't know where you got that from, but mind over matters. But you'll remember uh, meeting Josh Winchester and his daughter. Uh, and I think Joe Jensen came over from, um, and from, and I'm just going to talk. We only have three minutes, but I'm going to quickly buzz through this, just reminding people what DOC and Matt can do is, is, you know, we, we never ever spent as much money on anybody as we did on Josh getting his family back together again. So a guy who had mental health issues, had been back to prison six times. And uh, we know he came out of prison clean and sober because he was UA'd at the first, he was UA'd when he left the prison. He, he, he UA'd at the first Oxford house we had him in and this in two nights later, the second Oxford house. So we know he was clean and sober and he used UA with DOC when he met his first pro- his probation officer. So we knew he was clean and sober. And then the department of corrections mandated that he see a psychiatrist at Valley cities up by North Seattle college and that psychiatrist who ought to be on death row as far as I'm concerned, or in one of Mike Oberlin's intensive management units, um, demanded, I mean, mandated that Josh get on Suboxone and his life went up in, in, in the, his, his, the life of his daughter, uh, and his life, everything. It didn't just fall apart. It blew up, blew up. So we learned about the MAT program. Watching, watching Suboxone destroy Josh Winchester's life uh, and, and in, a, in a very close way, his daughter. And so, yes, I don't know how the, 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 this, you know what? I keep thinking about DOC. It's just it, it, when I'm talking to media, including these CNN New York people, I just referring to them. They're rotten to the core. And that's really what they are. Get Jay Inslee and Cheryl Strange, Washington State Department of Corrections. It's just rotten to the core. If there's a headline for this radio show, it's it's going to be it should be Mike Mike McCormick and Ari Cohn talk about the Washington State Department of Corrections being rotten to the core. They're frauds. The DOC is a fraud. They're, they're frauds. They do not do what they don't do what their mission says they do. They're liars and frauds, and it's it's disgusting and heartbreaking. Um, and I look forward to getting the CNN piece, or am I getting the CNN piece to you uh, as soon as we have it? And I think it's going to be very comprehensive. 
And I, and by the way, I'm going to send a video of this to, to CNN. Um, and then we'll go from there. So thank you, sir. Is now, hey, but here's to reincarnation of mind over matters right behind you. It's, it, this should be a banner mind over matters. Really? This should be a podcast mind over matters. What a great show that was. How many wonderful interviews we had with each other on there. Thank you, sir. Thank you.